Hi, everybody. How are you? You are the horsemen who came in from the sun. That's good, but I'm supposed to have some slides here, guys. Where are they? What happened? I don't see them. Oh, coming. Okay. Well, the clock is ticking. Oh, anyway, what, um, what I want to talk about is the Eastern inner science, what they call in India Adhyatma Vidya, the internal or interior science. And uh, because in India in ancient time they didn't, they thought that they made a very interesting uh, decision. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Yeah. Shakyamuni Buddha, the scientist, preceding Darwin, Heisenberg, Bohr, Freud, and Einstein, educational and social revolutionary. That's the title. And I have a few pictures at the beginning. That uh, on the right is the peaceful form of transcendent intelligence. Manjushri, his name, holding the sword of critical insight. And on the right is his terrific form, in which he uses, he manifests in order to confront the Yama, the god of death, known as Yamantaka. I call it, I call it the terminator exterminator, which is a symbol of immortality. If death dies, no one dies. That's, that's the idea of it. And then here is the mother of, uh, of all Buddhas on, the, on the, your right side, as you look at this ancient manuscript, which is of the 8,000 verse Prajnaparamita Sutra. Transcendent Wisdom Sutra. And um, the one on the regardless on the right is the mother of Buddhas. Here is a, on the right is a Javanese sculpture of her and a Cambodian sculpture of her. Unfortunately, she lost her arms in the book in the Cambodian one. And, uh, and this is a Tibetan painting of her. And she's the goddess of the uh, mother of all Buddhas. Something somehow like uh, Shunyata, rather than thought of as emptiness, you know, the great Buddha's great revolutionary scientific insight. Uh, is viewed as a nurturing membrane that encloses reality, not a dark void or space, although they use the word emptiness and voidness. But by that they are distinguishing it from nothingness. And what they mean actually is relativity. What emptiness really means is relativity. It means that every, just to say it simply to start before we go into it, it means that everything lacks any essence, intrinsic real, intrinsically real essence that is non-relative. There's no absolute in anything, no absolute in the self, no absolute in the floor, in the roof, in the planet, anywhere. No absolute in nothingness, there's no such thing. And everything is empty of that, therefore all, everything is totally interrelated. So what emptiness actually means is the space of the, it's the space of the womb of the flow that is the relational reality in which we all live. And she is a, holds the book she holds on her left hand, one of her left hands, which is the book of transcendent wisdom, which is the sort of archetype of Buddhist science. And I just couldn't resist showing this one. This is, I call her Ms. Buddha. Just so people in California are not upset, this is a female Buddha, all female, no male, just female. And uh, she's called the Vajra Yogini. And she's not in a fierce form, it's called a slightly fierce form because she's shown in a dominating form, therefore bright red. And, and stark naked means that She's totally at one with the, with the flow of reality. There's no barrier between her and that. Okay, now here we're beginning. I'm going to, you know, some of these I have to skip because there are too many, of course. But um, this is my key point, in a way, starts at the beginning. That um, Weber, uh, who some of you probably know, the great German sociologist, he, did, he was very having a hard time classifying Buddha as a religion founder, a prophet. And so he, he um, the reason is that Buddha was not sent by God to tell people God would save them if they believed and behaved in a certain prescribed ways. Buddha declared that people had to save themselves by knowing reality, and he could help them, of course, by teaching. And, uh, what? Oh, good. And number two got lost. And so he met God, actually. It isn't that Buddha just did this on his own. He did meet Brahma who was considered the creator by some people in India at that time, many, most people. And uh, Brahma told him, uh, please go tell human beings that I'm not omnipotent, I'm not omniscient, I like it when things go well for them and they worship me, I, I admit I like it, I have a little bit of an ego, a god ego. But when horrible things happen to them, I really don't like to be blamed by them, I don't like it when they get mad at me. So it's better that you tell them that we're in this together. I'm very powerful, I like to help, 
but uh, they have to, they create their own suffering equally with me. We work together on it. You know, the, the, the Buddhist view of reality is that reality is made of a meeting of minds. It isn't just any one person's mind. It's a meeting of many minds and not only human minds, human and divine and demonic and all kinds of minds. So, so therefore, Weber tried to solve that by saying Buddha was an exemplary prophet rather than an emissary prophet, and the latter being the usual kind that founds religions and so forth. So I'm trying to let's go. Oh yeah, so today I'm putting forth the thesis that Buddha was first and foremost a scientist in the true sense of the word. That is to say, he sought to discover the nature of reality and describe the functions of causality. He was therefore called Buddha, defined as the most successful possible scientist, uh, in that he actually did fully realize the, the actual ultimate nature of reality. He, he awakened, and also to have understood the deepest workings of causality, he blossomed into enlightenment. So both, both um, uh, second, he understood that reality is ultimately excellent, supportive, and beneficial. Loving meaning, loving meaning satisfying, having an infinite energy to satisfy the needs of all sensitive beings who are open to that infinite energy. And that it wasn't his, it didn't belong to him, but it is the nature of ultimate reality, it's his discovery, that's what nirvana means. And that other beings could also understand it other human beings especially privileged to do so, divine beings also can understand it. And that only by understanding it can they find freedom from their suffering. Against Socrates, who said the unexamined life is not worth living, a little more pessimistic than Buddha, human life is definitely worth living, whether examined or not, but it will be unsatisfactory and frustrating if not fully examined, investigated, and then understood, which was the radical thing for Buddha, saying that, Ultimate, that reality can be understood. We can understand it completely. It isn't that we have to take some authority's word for it, or we can have come up to some idea that ultimately you can't know anything. In a way, you can't know it in a dualistic, conceptual way, but you can experience it and know it in the real way of thoroughly understanding it, according to him. That was his, that's why I actually, in my youth, I abandoned Western things and I got into Buddhism. It was not because I was seeking religion, it was because I was seeking understanding. And I was told from both sides, the spiritual side and the scientific side, that you can't understand things, so you have to rely on authorities. And I didn't like that. And so third, his education system was de designed to be transformative of the whole society, not just the individual. But the trans transformation does proceed one individual at, at a time, one sand conference at a time. <laughs> no doubt there are contested views. Um, the universities are not really delivering it, frankly. I must say, after four, almost 50 years of working in them, they are not really delivering these understanding. They are, they are indoctrinating kids that they must follow different authorities and making them fit for productive work, et cetera, et cetera, besides charging them lots of money, much too much money. No doubt there are contested views about what is reality and ideas derived thence about what is realistic. So the, the Dalai Lama, I might skip this because the Dalai Lama is, has been in dialogue with scientists and this is thought to be a big thing that a leader of a world religion takes an interest in the secular anti-religious tradition of modern science, even though its definition is crippled by the dogma of materialism, which of course you heard a lot about here. And Deepak, that's why I love Deepak's work very much in that he challenges this orthodoxy that we have where the scientists are the high priest of a certain type of culture that we are brought up in, and uh, they are like the new inquisition, if you will, you know. And Deepak has the guts to go after that, which I think is really very good. Uh, so, but what if the Buddhist tradition, you know, that Alam is doing this within the Buddhist tradition, not just as his own idiosyncrasy? What if the enlightenment of the Buddha and his followers were found to precede the also rational, empirical, and therefore scientific tradition arisen in ancient Greece and after the Renaissance, after a long, dark period in Europe and today globally? What if Buddhism was a secular in the sense of based on the present reality and not on religious authority movement, rebelling against religion from its beginning? That, in other words, if you see the Renaissance and the, and the Reformation and the Enlightenment as a rebellion against religion, what if Buddhism did that 2,500 years earlier? or maybe 2,000 years earlier if we, go, if we look at that number. So I, I propose affirmative actions to them, and I'm not seeking a privilege for Buddhism among religions. Among religions, it's a, it, it's a religion for those who don't study it thoroughly, who just use it in some way of depending upon it. 
but who, who, do, who go into its education system, it's really not, not what we define, modern social scientists define as a religion, namely a belief system and a, and a ritual system, although they have rituals and beliefs. I acknowledge that my argument is intentionally quite challenging to our current academic consensus, which is in need of the major paradigm shift I'm offering, and Deepak offers, that we are so all struggling toward, and some scientists are struggling toward, but young scientists have to be very careful or they'll ruin their careers. If they, old scientists can do it, because then the other ones will say, well, they're over the hill, so now they're looking for, a little, consol looking for a little consolation after chopping up those frogs all these years. And, <laughs> And, uh, and the young ones don't dare do it, or they won't get tenure, or they won't get hired, you know, they're oh, like some weirdo, they go to the sand conference, uh-oh, you know. Uh, the, the, the PSYCOP and this kind of organization will see to it that they have a hard time getting hired in regular academia. So, I think I'll skip this one. This is, I'm, 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 I'm challenging these, these, this, this consensus. And, uh, but I'm saying that, you know, we think that we're forward and we're so developed and we're so knowledgeable and, you know, the, our definition of enlightenment is having a PhD and having a tenure in a research university if you're in a science, especially if you're a natural scientist. Social scientists are desperately trying to be like national, natural scientists and, and humanities scholars want to try to get a social scientist, social science backing so they can feel real, you know. And, uh, and the humanities are like, that's a window dressing for cocktail parties, to be able to mention, mention Dante or something like that. I'm sorry, but that's our university system. And, um, but I'm saying we are not advanced. We are backward, actually. We are a backward civilization or culture. Like Gandhi said to Churchill, famously, you probably know that, many of you, in this conference, where Churchill asked Gandhi, like, what did he think of our British civilization? And Gandhi said, British civilization? Well, that would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we are, so I fit in that tradition, and our materialism is not a discovery, but a metaphysical dogma, a trap, an obstacle to the further development of our sciences. Our unrealistic worldview is leading us, in fact, to destroy the world, and that because we have magnified our power over matter by manipulating it in micro and macro ways, and we have convinced ourselves, therefore, that we are on the right track. But from the inner science point of view, because we, we have all this outer power, what, what this outer power is doing is magnifying our greed, that call that consumerism, magnifying our hatred and anger, that we call that militarism, and uh, uh, magnifying our depressing individualism, you know, this useless random life that we lead that has no meaning and blah, 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 no future life, and all you have to do is shoot yourself and you're finished and you're permanently extinct. And, and you don't even regret that you didn't live a little longer because you don't know that you ever lived. And, you, and what you're, that's the worldview, the, that's the worldview of materialism, I'm sorry to say. So our m misplaced hubris would actually be comical if not so tragic in its impact. We're caught in the process of self-destruction due to our confusion about the nature of life, about what we are and what this world is. Because none of us have consciousness, of course. We're just biological robots, supposedly. And we are about to confirm our conviction of the realism and value of our materialist worldview by our success in destroying ourselves and most of the other living beings on this planet. I'm sorry, but that's a fact. You know, we can't just blame the Koch brothers. We cannot blame the massive subliminal despair and defeatism we harbor about sustaining our lives on this planet just on some greedy petro-capitalists and corrupt politicians while failing to look at ourselves and our crippling worldview that prevents us from controlling ourselves and thereby controlling them. Well, this is a... Thank you. This is the thing. So, so I, I'm going to skip a little now because I want to get to the thing. And, you know, it's heresy. So a friend of mine who makes movies was thinking of making a bio movie about me, and he's so brilliant, he immediately decided that the final scene would be me in uh, Widener Lo Hall or in, or in Lowell Library having a heresy trial by the natural scientists <laughs> for teaching that, that former and future life is a scientific proposition, and there's a lot of evidence for it, etc., while that you will be nothing when you die is a complete blind faith assertion, and that's all. There's no evidence that anything ever can be nothing. Absolutely none. And therefore, it's nothing but a blind faith assertion. That's all, which they cling to desperately because they're all, everybody's afraid of hell, you know, let's face it. We, 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 we happily say in our culture, go to hell to somebody because we, don't, we, we are convincing ourselves there's no such thing. So... Uh, 
anyway, I'm gonna skip that otherwise. I think I think I said that. Okay. Okay. So, but, but, but because of the worldview, it's why we, there's no real action. I mean, what is this about climate change? Everybody agrees it's there, except a few loonies, like our, one of our current candidates. And uh, although I think he's kind of sinking into another place at the moment, and uh, luckily. And, uh, and uh, you know, no, no, let's not, I'm not supposed to be political, but I can't resist. I see all these, I see all these voters here. And uh, please do vote. And, um, and uh, so, you know, we, but we basically inside, we don't feel we can make a difference. We, we can do it. We settle down in our lives of quiet desperation, as Thoreau aptly called it almost 200 years ago. That's the industrial way of living. Uh, that's how, what happened. And I'm going to skip this stuff. Uh, what I, you know, I'm not trying to make anybody a Buddhist, I'm saying there and so forth. And I just want to overthrow. I think I was born to do this, actually. Uh, I had a dream when I got my PhD at Harvard that, there, that I was getting the PhD. I didn't go to the ceremony, but I was getting the PhD and, uh, from a Japanese guy who was giving me like a samurai sword or something of critical intelligence, perhaps, and uh, some certification. But then there was a nuclear cloud floating over the yard, you know. And I always wondered what it meant, and I think I finally understand what it is is that, you know, we have to face our destructive, the destructive nature of our ideology, and we have to deal with it, okay? Anyway, I'm going to skip that, because I, I want to come to this. Um, so now, the key discovery of the Buddha, because I see this thing is ticking very, very violently here, we have the world totally upside down. We think often, subliminally only, unfortunately, that relative reality is made of a variety of absolutes. We think that we, especially ourselves, are absolutes against subliminally, except when we lose ourselves in the grip of strong emotion or conviction. In other words, this is the Buddhist insight that the, the false wiring, the false sense of self of the unenlightened person, such as myself, is that it, I think that there's a thing in there that's the real Bob, that is somehow, the, as the old Mongolian Lama used to say, it's right, everybody's right that they exist, and everyone is real. You know, if anybody says Buddhism says you don't exist, that's not what Buddhism says. The Buddha never says that. Well, you, you're real, but our problem is each of us thinks we're really real. That's the problem. We exaggerate the degree of reality. We think there's a fixed absolute thing in there and, and that that's the real us. And that puts our, makes our life problematic because everything changes. We're caught in a swirl of impermanence and transformation and decay and, and then rebirth and so forth. And, and we're trying to hold on to what we think is some real thing. And also, we put in things that we see, we invest in it, uh, what, what the sociologists of knowledge call brilliantly, I love, could be a Buddhist translation, massive facticity of objects, as if there's something inside them that makes them the object they are, some essence, you know. And philosopher, metaphysical philosophers have been, you know, proposing things from Plato's ideas to all kinds of things for thousands of years in the West. But, you th but from Buddha's time, they saw through that in India, and they realized that that is a false mental construction that you have, especially about the self. And when you see it is when you lose your temper, you blow your top, or you become obsessed with having to have something, or you become depressed to a self-destructive level. And that's where you, you feel that that emotion comes from an absolute place which you cannot resist. You cannot speak back to your own impulse. And that shows that that, that emotion, it seems to us, uh, subliminally all the time, to be grounded in an absolute thing. Oh, thank you. I love you, Kavali singers, by the way. Thank you so much for that. Well, you know, I, I was so sad that... Uh, that they shot that one really great one, the son of that guy, you know, who he sang once for us in Carnegie Hall. And after he sang, Dave Matthews had to come out and sing, uh, for us I'm saying Tibet House, which is my thing as a benefit, he sang there. And Dave Matthews came out and had to sit in silence for five minutes because after that flight of music, no one could speak, you know, it was incredible. So thank you so much and good luck on your movie. Sorry, digression. <laughs> so. So, therefore, we think this is what it means that ourselves are absolutes. Subliminally, we think, we feel we're absolute. I'm the one. That same teacher of mine used to say, everyone secretly goes around thinking, I'm the one. <laughs> and enlightenment is, is so simple. It's simply realizing that you're just one of the ones. And others are one, too. And actually, there's a lot more of them than you. Therefore, you should pay more attention to them, be more altruistic and less self-centered. That's it. It's not some big light blowing off in your head, you know. There are lights that go off in your head for various reasons. <laughs> but, but some good, some bad. 
But, uh, but that's not what enlightenment is. Enlightenment is identifying with everything and everyone where love becomes the way, the natural mode of exchange between you and them, which is why it's associated with the female, with the mother of all Buddhas, which is the wisdom of selflessness. Okay? So I'm jumping because I know the time. So our fixed, rigid self-identity is the real us, we think. We are not just real, we're really real. That it opposes a world which itself is absolutely other than us. And that situation, me versus universe, is obviously a losing proposition and produces only frustration, alienation, and suffering. This is really what Buddha discovered. So Buddha investigated this unfortunate situation and luckily he found that we were in error and that the fixed separate self is an illusion, which doesn't mean that there's no self relational self, a constantly changing work in progress or work in decay, one or the other self, which doesn't mean growing old doesn't put it in decay necessarily, but behaving badly does put it in decay, and uh, which imprisons and cripples the flowing relational self. And that's the big no self thing in Buddhism. It is not, it's really the same in, when they talk about supreme self in Hinduism, Vedantic Hinduism, they really mean the same thing when they say neti neti. It isn't this, it isn't that, it isn't your small sense of personality and so on. They're headed that way. Buddha just doesn't like to say that at the outset because, you know, he, he thinks people will attach to that, the distorted view that they have that my ego and my me is the real thing. I'm the real one. So he starts out with an anatma to challenge that habitual inner wiring, miswiring. So in reality, he discovered that we are free of intrinsic self-identity, which is one of the start, they have many great terms, lack intrinsic reality or intrinsic objectivity or intrinsic identifiability. Uh, that the relational changing flow self that we have always we have always been and will ever be is originally free of any sort of habitually assumed and instinctually sensed, non-relational, intrinsically self-subsistent, independent, fixed self, which some religions and many philosophers have called the individual immaterial self or immortal soul, thereby supporting the self-defeating subliminal delusion of isolated core self-identity. Got that? You should. You should. It's really not complicated. It's really very simple. So Buddha realized his freedom from such an unreal psychosis-causing, alienated, isolated self-habit with what's called the selfhood instinct, the absolute selfhood instinct, I should say. Astonished, he vastly enjoyed the release of his relative self. He realized experientially, his inf in, which is the same as experimentally, you scientists, experience, experiment leads to experience, even if it's a measurement, and you can also experience something by measuring it in, with your own cognitive embrace, when you, when you transcend your subjective uh, withdrawal from things, thinking that you capture them with a theory or a number or something like that, you, you directly intuit their reality. That's, that, that is, that's what the Buddhist wisdom is about. Uh, so he realized experientially his infinite interconnection with all life, beings, and things. Because when you realize emptiness, the, you know, many people, even in Buddhism, mistakenly think when they have that sky experience, that vast experience that you have when you look for that hardcore self and don't find it, if you really have the concentration, you will have a kind of experience where everything disappears, you disappear, but sort of you have a continuity of having gotten into it, and you feel a great release when you're in it, and you think this is really great, it's all one, and, but, and luckily nobody's here to bother me, and it's all me. <laughs> it's kind of the last psychotic experience, actually, although Many people think it's a great mystical thing, and, when, and who, who experience it, even they themselves think so, and then they come back because you, they didn't actually go anywhere, they just withdrew into a sense of isolation, completely by concentration, and then the realm of infinite space, infinite consciousness, they describe it beautifully, the phenomenological Buddhist scientists, uh, mind scientists, and, uh, but then they go around thinking they're higher than other people because I disappeared. You know, oh, I had a big disappearance experience, and, and they think they'll go back there when they die. And I call that the cheap oneness experience, <laughs> because it's cheap, because you're all one, it's all one, and nobody's there but you. <laughs> so that's just, you know, and you're not there, you're not floating there like a little body, it's just that you have the continuity of having attained that, and so you, ca you capture it in your memory, and you think that was enlightenment, and I'm going back there. And it's just escapism. It's really not the, it's not the real thing. But sadly, then all these gurus, a lot of them behave badly. Did you notice? They want Rolls Royces, they want adulation, they want worship, etc., because they can disappear. But my statement to them is, everybody disappears every night. <laughs> and you love it. Bam! 
if you can't fall asleep, you get upset and take an Ambien to knock yourself out. And uh, so we're all doing that. We can't bear to be in this differentiated state of me versus the universe more than 12 to 16 hours at a time. And then we have to pass out. So what's the big deal about attaining a meditative state where you disappear? You know, it's, if you, it's a misinterpretation if you think that's ultimate reality. It is an ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is this right here. That's what non-duality means. Ultimality is where it's all one and everybody else is here. And therefore you are all of them. Which means, it, which is not that unrealistic. It is very unrealistic at first. But after all, you've all been in love, right? And when you were in love, it was the beloved was everything and you identified with her. Or maybe you were in a team if you didn't manage that and you're right guard and left flank, whatever, or you're in a buddy system in war and you, you identify with other people. And then Buddhahood is simply where you identified with everyone and you therefore love them all because they are you. It's like you love your own hand to the degree that you don't put it in a hot pot, you know, or if it gets burnt, you immediately to go to fix it. With, and you don't say, oh, I'm being so nice to my hand, I'm really compassionate. You don't think that, because you feel that feeling. And in a way, you feel the feeling of all those beings you're in love with when you become a Buddha. They say that a Buddha is a being who perceives every other sensitive being, not just humans, every single one, as the mother perceives her only beloved child. They say that. So, so anyway, that's what Buddha did. He realized that, and he felt... Rea because the problem is, you see, you couldn't be in love and experience yourself as one with the others if you didn't have that experience I was a little bit teasing about, where it all disappeared, because then when you come back from that, you realize that your experience of others as being separate from yourself is illusory. It's not an absolute illusion, but it's illusory. And you realize that they also sort of can disappear when looked for in the absolute sense. And I always tell people as an exercise, they should do a thought experiment. Every physicist should do it. Try to find their own nose. You know your life lifelong hood ornament? Your nose, unless you have a really small one, it's always out there going ahead of you, right? Like the, like the Mercedes hood ornament, you know, the little triangle. It's your nose. But try to find your nose in a scientific manner. Pinpoint it exactly. Find exactly what is the nose and not the cheek and not the air in the nostril, etc. cetera, the, the, the brow. Where does the nose stop and start? What is the nose? You will, it will dissolve under analysis. You'll have a thought experiment. You'll be like Einstein, you know, you'll, the clocks will turn backwards and everything, and your nose will disappear. And then it'll be back. But then when it's back, once it disappeared, when you try to really pin it down, you realize it's just a relative nose. Then you can be cool about your nose. If you get a big boil on the tip of it, you're a little more relaxed about it, you know, because it's not absolute nose. But see, we think it is an absolute nose, and yet those kind of thought experiments are used meditatively very powerfully, and all of that stuff you read in Heart Sutra, everything, there's no nose, no eye, no ear, no et cetera. It means in that look of really pinning down what it is. It's all there when you don't look for it in that analytic way, and you can flow with it as a relational thing that you relate to. So, so, but then, so then he sees, he's able to identify with all beings because he sees them all as made of that same bliss that he has found, because the emptiness is not nothingness, it is the fabric of everything, but what it is, is by that relativity, there is an infinite, you know, sustaining energy within all of it. You know, it's the pantheistic heresy, as far as your heavy Protestant theologian goes. It's like, God is everywhere in it. It is the love of God is everything, it makes everything. It, it's what, the, in a way, it's the ultimate substance, we call it the clear light of the void in, in the Buddhist uh, science, you know, mind science. And so, so therefore, he can identify with them because he sees everyone as actually all right. But because he or she, I showed you Ms. Buddha to start with, he or she is also completely empathetic with all the other beings. They realize that the other beings don't know they are made of bliss. And they're like mad because they don't have enough bliss and they want this and they want that and they need the other and they're afraid of the other and they are doing also harmful things to others which is making them more isolated from them and it's really it's unethical and bad and they're feeling worse and worse and so that's where then the compassion cannot ignore the wisdom cannot ignore that others don't share that view and therefore all one can do for them but one cannot force them you can't be a bliss bomb or something you can't go hug them if you huggable, when you, luckily everybody who's huggable I know is, in this conference is not paranoid. Because go try to hug a paranoiac and you'll find yourself in the World Wrestling Federation. You know? <laughs> They'll be freaked out. They'll think you're an enemy and you're coming to do something to them. 
So, so, you, so, so they have to learn themselves to open themselves to their actual reality, which is actually okay. That's the key discovery of Buddha. Buddha's key discovery is not suffering. That everybody knows about suffering. It doesn't take a Buddha. What Buddha's key discovery is, is nirvana, freedom from suffering. That that is our potential, that is our possibility, and that we can all attain, actually. And we will, actually, even. Nobody will not attain it. Resistance is impossible. We will be assimilated by nirvana. There's no question. <laughs> Luckily, it won't make us into robots. It, we can we assimilate it by being alive to our own reality and our own loving hearts and our own open mind. You know, that's what it is. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, I'm going on. Then I talk, the Buddha had, had three bodies, you know, reality body, beatific body, and emanation bodies. But I don't want to explain all of that because of the time, which is running short. So he, now this is really fun. This experiential empirical discovery is science-based, not religion or faith-based. He rebelled against the Vedic religion of the time, particularly its sacrificialism, the idea of taking an animal's life in order, to, in order to do something holy and that God wanted a burger or something. I mean, that he didn't like that. He was freed by knowledge, become wisdom, intuition, and so can we all be. And the first step is called the realistic worldview. First step is not meditation, actually. First step is called realistic worldview which is felt to be necessary, a realistic worldview, in order not to go in a wrong place through meditation, because you, meditation can take you, you know, your Paris Island recruit meditates on hatred of the enemy and becomes more violent, in fact. So meditation is a neutral tool of conditioning of a person to become more some particular way, and you have to choose the target that you meditate on, and that's the realistic worldview, the first branch of the Noble Eightfold Path. And the, the, the main thing about realistic worldview is not belief in Buddha, not belief in it, belief in causation, which is a very scientific thing. You know, I, I once had a college president at one college I taught at for a long time who used to tell a story about, uh, I think, Galen, and who, who decided that he would look for causes of a disease rather than propitiate Athena or someone for when people got sick. And he sort of cured people, therefore, because he looked at a process. Causation took away the power of the gods, where the priests interceded with them to keep you well and do all of this, supposedly, in Buddha's time and in the time of uh, the Greeks. And the uh, discovery and use of analysis of things by causation is the paradigmatic scientific thing. And then you see what are negative causes, what are positive causes. You try to stop the negative ones and develop the positive ones. And that's Buddha's main thing. This is his great mantra. I want you all to say it with me. Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetun Tisham Tathagata Hyabadat Tisham Chayo Nirodho Evamvadi Mahasramaniye Swaha <laughs> And what that means is all things, of all things that arise from causes, what are those causes, and how to interrupt them, how to, how to cease them, that is the path taught by the great um, Shramana, which means like something like dropout or vacationer, I like to translate it. People often translate it as ascetic, but I think that's a little incorrect. I call it the great vacationer, because he dropped out of the rat race because he wanted to use his life to become enlightened, because that's what human... The aim of life in Buddhism is learning. You, all you academics, be happy what you, that you do that. Learning more, is, and ha all of you who are here at this conference, learning is the, aim of, is the purpose of life. You don't learn to go out and make money or make something in a factory or produce this and that or raise a family. That you might do all of those things, but the more you learn, the happier you are. And, um, and your brain likes to learn, you know? And those who teach and those who study know that, and that they know that's the most marvelous thing. Anyway, all science works with causal processes, and uh, I have to skip because um, I want to go to more shocking things. That's Four Noble Truths. I wish I had time. I wish I had time. Four Noble Truths are so good, but I said it already mainly of the Four Noble Truths, or Noble Facts, as I, I think is more, sounds more secular and that's a possible translation. And the Four Noble Facts are that, you know, if you're unenlightened, meaning you think it's you versus the universe, and that's the real situation, then you will suffer because you will never conquer the universe. Even you can, you know, be a billionaire and live in the Trump Tower, you will not conquer everybody. We are noticing. And uh, second, 
Second, the source of that is a distorted ego sense, an exaggerated sense of self. It is not the fact that you are there, that's not wrong, but that you're really there and you're the main person there. That is obviously the source of sickness, which we are all seeing nowadays all the time. On, and we can find it on Twitter. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, that's the second one. Third one is that there is freedom from that, and that is the more, g more real reality. The real reality is freedom from suffering. It is bliss. It's being blown away. Nirvana literally means being blown away. And, uh, and then finally, there's an educational path, education in ethics, education in mental insight, and education in wisdom, which is science, actually, investigating reality, external as well as internal. And so, uh, so here, the Shunyata Karna Garbam, this is the discovery of relativity. I think the day will come, probably not in my lifetime, but where scientists, you know, modern, so-called modern scientists, might decide that someone without all the machinery, without, the, without Ford motor cars and subways and atom bombs, might have discovered relativity long ago, and it might actually be a more comprehensive relativity than the mathematical one that Einstein did, leaving intact some things like gravity and speed of light and spooky action at a distance and God not playing dice and all this. Why shouldn't God have a little dice game? And, and uh, you know, that was already discovered, and it was so fully discovered and so fully realized that the consequence of everything being interrelated, which is that the purpose of life is compassion, is love. That's what life is about. And the human being is evolved to that. So, so that, that that's a physical discovery. It is not some spiritual, mysterious thing that there's some emptiness over some other place. It is not. It is, this is the nature of reality. This is all relativity. And we are all relatives, you know, like the, like the Lakota people say, you know. We are all, everyone is my relative. I'm sorry. In fact, there's a way Buddhist meditation because of all of our previous infinite lives. Every one of you has been my mother. And I hereby apologize for, <laughs> for all, those, all those, even you men have been my mother. And I apologize for biting your nipple. And also, I've been all of your mother. And uh, I forgive you. So, <laughs> so, so that's, the, and then the scientific method, you know. All teachings about relative reality are hypotheses. There's no absolute dogma laws of relative reality. It's a relative reality. There are valid and invalid theories based on, uh, on accurate or inaccurate experience. They can always be revised and upgraded and so forth. It, it, just like Popper, there's a scientific idea that there's no dogmas about relative reality. And for example, the materialistic reductionism based on a kind of dogma is not correct but also mentalistic reductionism, saying everything is consciousness is also, in a way, ultimately not correct. It is correct that consciousness is the more powerful of the duality. Because as you know, it's like one of my lamas said, the real trigger of the nuclear detonation, the destruction of Hiroshima, is not just the dropping of the bomb and the, and the plutonium bomb and the mechanisms, it's the hatred in the hearts of the people who built it, the people who decide to drop it, and who people who in the plane who pull the trigger uh, to release the bomb. That human mind creates it, actually, he said. And, but, they, but, we, but we don't want to take responsibility of having minds. Our scientific reality people don't, and that's their big problem. But on the other hand, if you go to a point where you see mind and matter as completely interrelated and interwoven, which is the Buddhist view, it loses meaning to say everything is only consciousness when there is no opposite of consciousness, namely inanimate things. So, you know, it's consciousness. You can do mentalistic reductionism, and you can do, if you're really free in science and really non-dogmatic and really treating all laws of nature as hypothetical, standard models and all, dark matter, dark energy. I love Deepak's, uh, Deepak's expose of all of the complete fabric of, of mutual paradigm self a congratulation that goes on, which, which really is all short of real certainty. And uh, I love that. But on the other hand, so you can do reductionism in either direction if it's useful in some case, but none of them are absolute. Finally, no consciousness, no matter, that's also good. So, so, that's, a, that's, a, that's what they say. So, that's relativity. And these are all things that are make it like science, that so time is running out. And, um, and maybe we can talk more about some of these things. Then there's depth psychology. The discovery of the unconscious, dealing with it. But the Buddhist difference there is you don't want to die with your unconscious still unconscious. You want to become conscious of your unconscious, and you can do that using contemplative technologies. 
you can, not just by going to a shrink and having a dream. That's good, but that takes a long time, very expensive. And instead, you can use meditative technologies to recover deep memories and memories of previous lives, etc. You can find everything is stored in your unconscious. Everybody was a dinosaur personally. Everybody's big Tyrannosaurus Rex and a big munchy vegetarian one that got eaten by the Tyrannosaurus. We were all in Jura the ancient Jurassic Park, you know, being chased around by weird, weird military techies. And, and uh, we all were. We all were. And so we have all the knowledge of all species of animals, not just genes, but we personally, and we personally have done it. We did. So we therefore can identify with all of those beings. So that, so they, and therefore, when you die, if you aren't conscious of your unconscious impulses and drives, they will drag you in rebirth situations that you won't necessarily like. So therefore, the Buddhist, that's why there's so many meditation centers in, in Buddhist cultures, so many sand, sand conferences that go on year round, which is what they were. They were schools. They weren't just people going, duh, and lobotomizing themselves. They were schools where they were learning about their unconscious and plumbing it by meditative technology of extreme refinement and, and thing, which our psychologists would do well to learn instead of caving into neuroscience and acting like they're going to find the brain mechanism which makes you think you're here. <laughs> you know? So, you know, your mind actually, when you die, according to the Book of the Dead, and I recommend my Book of the Dead to all of you, my translation of it, but when you die, the minute after death, you become nine times more intelligent when your mind is outside your brain. And you automatically become telepathic and clairvoyant. And they actually tell you when you go to your own funeral and your Uncle Joe is saying, oh, I miss Bob, oh, he's, where's Bob? And, and then underneath he's thinking, good riddance, sad Bob, you know, I'm sick of him. You know, like, thank goodness I don't have to listen to him on Thanksgiving. And then don't be mad because that'll upset you in your subtle dreamlike state and you'll be set off in a bad place, negative place by getting angry. So don't be mad. And if the priests are just thinking about having a beer after the ceremony when they're reciting the pious language, don't be upset with them. Every human being, has multiple levels in their mind, and you just are, and we are all naturally clairvoyant and telepathic. We suppress it because we have so much noise in our own mind, we don't want to hear the noise in other people's minds. So, so, so that's, that's depth psychology. Then, this is the real killer, evolutionary biology. Karma is not destiny, it is not fate, no. Karma is uh, just a law of causation. It just means cause and effect, karma means. That's all it means. And it's, therefore, it's evolutionary. But it's what Thomas Nagel, this philosopher at NYU, recently wrote a book called Mind, uh, Mind and Cosmos, where it's a, it's, a, it's a biology that includes the mind as part of the causal process. It's just like Darwin, as far as, you know, the, the people who, uh, in, uh, you know, fundamentalists here and there who don't want to be monkeys, you know, they don't want to be related to monkeys. They just, Adam just popped right out of the white male god right? And, uh, and there he was there, right? So that's what they want to be connected to, and they don't want to be like monkeys or people of other races or males don't want to be like females, something like that. So therefore, they, uh, they are afraid of that. But from ancient time, karma people, everybody knows they were personally monkeys. We are all a bunch of ex-chimpanzees in this room. It, it, it's like not a big deal. We just lost our hair, and we're kind of weird. We have no tail anymore. We can't climb trees. Everyone was personally, not just your genes, you yourself. And that was accepted to people, mil billions of people over many centuries as a very commonsensical thing. And so, and the mind is what gets you there. If you live like a chimpanzee, when you die, like I had a llama, I know it's running way out here, but uh, I, had a, I had a llama who was really upset about Miss Piggy. He was very nervous about it. He kept complaining about Miss Piggy. He was staying in our house for a year, an academic year, giving lectures and me translating at Amherst College. And he said, that Miss Piggy, I like her too, he said. But young children, if they die prematurely and they just really have the hearts for Miss Piggy, it's not a good thing. <laughs> they may seek rebirth in a pig form, thinking it's so nice. You know, they'll ignore the no blonde hair and lipstick and everything, and they'll just uh, they'll see Mama Pig, and they'll head for it and become one of the little piglets. And then there'll be sausages in the store, you know. <laughs> it's really not a good thing. And we kept trying, to, oh, it's okay, Rinpoche. <laughs> there are a lot of animal stories in Buddhism. It's not a problem. Yeah, but you don't have a TV thing with colors, like, blazing it into the unconscious of the young person. So he was very worried about it. Anyway, so 2,400 years ahead of Darwin, rejecting creator, 
of omnipotent and putting the blame on him, rejecting a non-material soul and seeing even the soul as just super subtle energy, which is but they're keeping that a little esoteric so that people couldn't do it. So that's evolutionary karmic biology and, and uh, fully accepting relativity without being nihilistic. And because ethics becomes like that, if you were just, let me give one example, I know I ran out of time, but I'm stopped, just one last example. When you, because the ultimate goal in evolution is to identify with all life and be one with all beings in a loving, compassionate interconnectedness, that's called enlightenment, then anything that broadens your connection to other beings is virtue. And anything that cuts it off is sin or negative, anti bad, negative evolution. And so killing another animal is like saying, that life is not connected to me. You don't actually kill. The soul of that animal goes on, whether animal or human. It goes on, and then actually they, when they see you in ne their next life, they don't really like you subconsciously because you just killed them in the previous one. So it's not a good idea. But the main point is you sever yourself from a sense of connection to that life form. So you diminish and you intensify your isolation and sense of being different from the rest of the universe. If you save a life, you embrace that life and you sort of say, well, I'm responsible for that, it connects to me, and therefore my, I'm, I'm expanding my being, I'm being this other being whose life I saved as well, just on a simplistic level. So all Buddhist ethics is grounded in this hypothesis. Of course, karma is just a hypothesis because it's about relative reality. It's not the ultimate nature of emptiness slash relativity. It's just a description of the processes of life. But it's a very beautiful one in that in a secular way, a causal analysis way, it brings the mind back into reality and it, uh, and it makes us responsible for our situation. And uh, anyway, that's it. I ran out of time. So thank you very much. And, uh, have a great afternoon.